talk is money, honey. All we talk is money. Welcome back to Valuetainment. Obviously, I got my co-host for the day, Vincent Oshana here. Uh, if you don't know me, Adam Saws, they can call me Saws, but it's not about us today. It's about the one, the only, the sexiest, yes. the funniest, the, the devilish, wisest, the wisest, <laughs> the wisest. Gad Sad is in the house, evolutionary psychologist, behavioral scientist, unquestionably the funniest professor in the world. Did I, have I said any lies I, so I, far? I, not, none. No. Can I, can I, but what, what question, Adam? I, I, I don't think that there is another professor funnier than him. Period. Have you, have you seen my soccer skills? No. Are they good? I've I, seen your soccer skills. You've played soccer at Valuetainment. I've seen you do like some tape challenge or some. You're kicking something. Uh, I do. All what was kinds the of challenge challenges. that you were doing? Oh, I don't know. I don't remember. what You, you were saw. kicking something up in the air. It was like a it's little. It's a soccer thing. You maybe it was like oh, a paper. Oh, yeah. Oh, it was the toilet paper challenge. There it was. Sorry for, for confusing yeah, yeah, yeah. toilet paper with yeah. the duct tape. That was tape. at the start of uh, COVID. Correct. And I, I yeah. I've seen a ton of your stuff. I yeah. see you kicking things. I see you kicking down sort of the woke mind virus Indeed. that's going on, the parasitic mind that's going on. But here's some of the things I want to cover today. Sure. Because we were limited on time when I really want to be effective. Obviously, we want to talk about evolutionary psychology, sure. the role of a man, the role of a woman. Things have changed recently. I don't know if you know this, but Vinny's trying to get pregnant. So we're yes. gonna see how that goes not, for him. Not, yes. you gotta clarify. You did menstruate recently. Yeah. So we'll, we'll 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 touch on that. We'll talk about really what's going on in the universities, the woke LGBT brigade. I plus. How that has basically turned into whatever's going on on college campuses today. You saw what's going on on MIT, on Penn, Harvard, and Harvard, the Hamas. You should, uh, you should be me at my university. Yeah, because yeah. your university is in Montreal? So my university, colloquially, is called Gaza University. Stop before, it. Before this happened. And so now, I've had to hold several uh, classes by Zoom because it was too dangerous for me to walk into campus. Really? This is in the 21st century in Montreal, Quebec. So there's other topics, but let's get right into yeah, this. Yeah, because I... So, yeah. Um, you know, they say, you know, go woke, go broke. You've been talking about this for decades. Yes. Literally. Like, this is not new to you, but it is new to a lot of people out there, especially since what has happened since October 7th, and it's sort of come out on the forefront, um, the parasitic mind that's going on with that. So, the, in, on these universities today, you're a college professor. You're humorous. You know, you, you, you've got great points you're like your value tainment meaning you're providing so much value but you're entertaining that's what we love about the you. epitome of value so, tainment. first question this intersection intersectionality you've talked about it for sure. years people are just starting to hear this term decolonization we know what colonialization was simple question what the hell's going on in the world today god <laughs> yeah so the a lot of these ideas, parasitic ideas, they start off with a noble goal, yeah. right? So for example, transgenderist activists want to create a world where transgender people are free of bigotry. That's great, we cool. can all sign up yeah, for that. Yeah, nobody's objecting to anti-bigotry. Exactly, the problem comes that when in the service of that goal, you murder and rape truth. So sure. I can walk and chew gum at the same time. I can support the fact that transgender people should live free of bigotry, but I don't have to say men too can menstruate and men right. too can bear children. But you see this with all of the parasitic ideas. So for example, equity feminism was a great idea. Men and women should be treated equally under the law. We could all sign up for that. Yep. Then the radical feminists come in and say, well, if we wish to really eradicate the status quo, we need to argue that men and women are indistinguishable from each other, right? Everything is due to a social construction. So again, in the service of what started off as a good idea, you end up raping and murdering truth. And so what I argue in the parasitic mind is that each of these parasitic ideas starts off as a noble pursuit, and then it metastasizes in complete nonsense in the service of that original goal. So when you, you've been teaching for how long? How many decades? This is my 30th year. Wow. Mazel I started, tov. Thank you. I started as a, I finished my PhD. PhD, I was 29, got my first professorship at 29, 1994, and in June, it'll be 30 years. So, you know, there, we, I, Patrick and I talk about this all the time, that in universities, in the university system in America, I don't know how it is in Canada, when we started the podcast in 2020, I think it was like 12 to 1 professors in the United States, oh, yes. educators, are Democrats. liberal, liberals, yeah, yeah. Democrats liberal. Yeah, yeah. versus one 
conservative, Republican, yeah. let's say. So you might say, what's wrong with that? Okay, well now the numbers are closer to 15 to one. Yeah. So our youth is getting educated by people with only leftist ideas. Now, I'm all for the spread of ideas, debate and all that, but when they have a monopoly on ideas, the youth, the Gen Zs of the world, they're being exposed for the, oh, yeah. for, for the ridiculousness that's going on. Shed some light on what's really going on on campuses these days. Yeah, that's great. Not only in Canada, but across the United States and in the Western world. So there are fantastic studies that look at the Democrat to, to Republican ratios of the professors as a function of the discipline. And so in engineering, in the business school, where you are wedded to reality, yeah. where there are consequences to your nonsense. Like when you're doing math and you have to actually show your you work. Show. Yeah, yeah. There's an answer. There, there is no postmodernist economic model of consumer choice. There is no postmodernist bridge building, right? There's just physics and economics, right? And so, but even in those fields that you would think should be inoculated from that lopsided ratio, they're at around four, five to one. Now, as you go down the activism fields, you could get to 130 to zero. Jeez. So in other words, you're more likely to run into a unicorn than to run into a Republican <laughs> professor in the sociology department. Yeah. Wow. That's not good. What are the departments that are the 100, the, really, the, the worst one? Ones? Yeah. Anything that has to do with uh, studies. Uh, social. African social studies. Uh, gender. Peace <laughs> studies, environmental studies. Uh, sociology, yeah. all the activist fields, right? And, which, by the way, speaks to a really important point that I discussed in The Parasitic Mind. Universities are supposed to create knowledge and disseminate knowledge. They're not supposed to be ac activist centers. And that's what ends up happening with a lot of those disciplines. They forego their pursuit of truth because they think that there is a higher calling, which is to be a good activist. Therefore, the students are trained in activism rather in how to think and how to apply the scientific method. What's the famous quote? Like the best intentions are to are paved, by, yeah, exactly. paved in hell or whatever it is, yeah. lead the roadway to hell. So the, these universities, um, a lot, of the, a lot of this you've been talking about for years, so like you probably had this conversation a million times, but there's people that are like, dude, I had no clue that this was going on. I'm very worried about Gen Z, Yeah. right? Um, they're, they're identifying with the Hamas brigade. That's unbelievable. Um, they're, they're putting literal posters, uh, putting Osama bin Laden as a hero, or at least understanding Look, I'm 42 years old, you're 45, you're the sexiest 59. 59-year-old I've ever seen. Where did we go wrong in America today? And, you know, after October 7th, which anyone that has seen the attacks there has said this is some of the most brutal, heinous attacks, barbarism at its finest. How do you justify this, this intersectionality thing where Vinny's leading a... A gaze for Gaza, gaze uh, for Gaza trip. tour. We're gonna yeah. bring them there. We're bring I, wanna, all the I wanna see them. See, see how that see works how, how they really yeah. love them back. So but yeah, go ahead. Specifically in America, how did young college kids go down this wrong path? They're not idiots. They're at Harvard. Yeah. Okay. They're at MIT. They're at Wharton. Some of the smartest kids in the world. Where did they go wrong? Is it on them? Is it on so the there professors? Are, there are several. There are several mechanisms as relating to specifically the Hamas and why people now, you know, uh, encourage them or support them more than Israel. That comes from the oppressor, uh, oppressed uh, dynamic, right? Yeah. Uh, if you see an image of a Israeli tank and there is a 14-year-old with a slingshot that's throwing a rock at him, there is a reason why the maxim. Uh, 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 an image is, is equivalent to a thousand words, right? Most people are cognitive misers, meaning they're too intellectually lazy to actually think about a topic, right? They're TikTok generation. So when I see that image, I see the mean, nasty Zionist tank against the courageous, innocent, yes. oppressed Palestinian. That's all I need to now form an opinion. The Jews are nasty and mean Zionists, and the noble Palestinians are the oppressed. Good enough. Now create a whole bunch of cute TikTok videos and I'm good to go. And so th that's the problem, is that they don't spend enough time to actually navigate through the complexities of the issue. Again, because most people are cognitive mi misers. When, when uh, George Bush and uh, Barack Obama said, Islam is a religion of peace, what do we all do? We nod our heads and yeah. say, oh, yeah, Islam yeah. is a religion of peace. Well, it wasn't very peaceful when I had to put on 
running shoes and run really fast so that they didn't decapitate me. I could share with you a million societies over the past 1400 years that don't share the views of Obama and Bush that Islam is peace. But most people say, hey, if my president says Islam is peace, that's it, I yeah. accept it. Uh, Islam has a jihad problem, I think is the, is the best way to put it. By the way, you know what Islamic uh, sympathizers will say? It's because you don't understand what the word jihad means. Jihad comes in two forms. Yeah, there struggle, is, right? There is the external struggle in terms of violent jihad, but there's the internal struggle. So for example, when I resist eating french fries, That's I'm engaging jihad. in an internal jihad. It's not the Allahu Akbar before I slaughter yeah. you. That's, that's because you're a white westerner who doesn't truly understand Islam and Arabic. Mm -hmm. That's why, by the way, I'm a nightmare for them. Because I come from that region, because Arabic is my mother tongue, because I could quote all the stuff better than you probably can, and so usually I'm avoided because the stuff that they could pull to delegitimize your arguments, they can't pull it on me. So he's, his family is Iranian. Well, no, we're, right? we're Assyrian, but you know we don't have a country, so they were born in Iran, but we're Christians. You're Christians? Yeah. You're Lebanese Jewish. Your family fled Lebanon, a religious sure. persecution. The, where do we go from here? Just, you know, when Charlie Hebdo, when ISIS is beheading people, I, I feel like we're, we're revisiting 10 years ago when ISIS was taken over as the JV squad. Yeah. It's being relitigated like, well, maybe we were wrong, maybe they're right. You're a professor, you said you're getting chased out of campus. That's unbelievable. You have to do classes I, I actually via Zoom? Walk, and when I walk into class or, or to the campus, I'm greeted with security. Jeez. Straight up. Straight up. And by the way, the security in, in Montreal is not like security here where they carry guns. The security in Montreal is completely castrated. Because they have the whips that you use to whip they yourself? Have the, exactly, you just <laughs> whip yourself. Well, can I, can I ask you a question? Yeah, so guys, is it like, is this all, because not, not by, by design, but when you said like, you give you know people this idea and just man corrupts it throughout time. Is it that or is it like a conservative, like a concerted effort to just destroy the school? Like who would have thought that there was this much support for a terror group in all these schools. And then when you find out somebody like, apparently George Soros, and this is a fact, was funding a lot of these pro-Palestinian in the schools, it's like, is it, is it a concerted thing or is it just something that man? It, it's, it's several different things. So for example, the idea, and this is a, a parasitic idea from my book, cultural relativism basically argues that we should never judge the mores and the norms and the beliefs and the actions of another culture because yeah. that would be cultural imperialism. Yeah. So if in a particular society they cut off the clitorises of little girls, yeah. who are you to judge that it's a bad thing? Yeah. And all cultures are equal. Yeah. Well, then that opens the door to open immigration policies, yeah. right? which basically says, hey, allow people to come in in the millions into your society. Those people don't share an iota of your foundational cultural values. Mm -hmm. Actually, each of their cultural values are perfectly antithetical to your foundational values. What could go wrong? Well, guess <laughs> what could go wrong? You can have a lot of Jew hatred increase in Canada when you allow millions of people to come in from, middle, from the Middle <laughs> yeah, East, yeah. where, by the way, these are nonpartisan surveys, let's say the Pew surveys, yeah. that show that these societies have 95 to 99% Jew hatred. Meaning that if you sample a thousand people, 950 to 990 of the sampled people will have abhorrent views of Jews. And yet you import them in the millions. Well, what do you think is gonna happen? You're gonna get increased Jew hatred. I'll tell you a very quick story. Yeah, please. About a month ago, my son, uh, my wife had picked up my son from in a soccer match. He was playing in the east end of Montreal. They picked me up from a cafe where I was working on my laptop. As I walked into the car, my son, who's 11 years old, says, Daddy, if you were wearing a Star of David where I just played soccer, you'd be dead. Wow. Now, let me contextualize what I just said with a story that I recount in The Parasitic Mind. When we escaped Lebanon, the day that we escaped, and we cleared Lebanese airspace, the pilot had said, we are now out of Lebanese airspace. My mother takes out a Star of David, puts it around my neck, and says, now you can wear this proudly and not have to hide your identity. Wow. So look where we've gone in 45 years. We went from my mother puts the Star of David around me to my son saying in Montreal, Canada, don't ever wear a Star of David, wow. Daddy, where I play soccer. Yeah, well, Jeez. ridiculous story, ridiculous story. But it's interesting that you can be Muslim in a Christian country 
But you cannot be Christian or fill in the blank after that, Jewish, anything, in a Muslim country. Or you could be because we tolerate you. So kiss my hand because I allow you to exist. By the way, that's a concept in the Quran called dhimmi. A dhimmi Dimmi. is a second class, third class citizen that has to pay a jizya. Jizya is like a protection task. Tax. So yes, of course, you could find many periods in history where Jews lived or Christians lived peacefully until they have to run real fast, right? So it's kind of like I'm healthy until I drop dead of a heart attack, right? Yeah. So yes, Christians and Jews in Andalusia lived happily until they did it, right? Yeah. And this 10%, what is it called? Zizia. Zizia. So, you know, in, in Judaism, uh, tzedakah. Yeah in uh, Christianity, tithing, yeah. right? We've interviewed a lot of the mafia uh, personalities that are out yes. there, Sammy the Bull, Michael Francis. You'd have to pay 10% for protection. Of course. So your store or your shop- Doesn't get accidentally burned. Exactly. <laughs> Similar situation Lightning that's strikes. going on in exactly. the Middle East. So let's shift gears. Let's talk about evolutionary psychology. Yes, sir. And really, ultimately, I think what is a conversation going on these days is, what is a woman? What is a man? You know, up until, so let me Recently, tell you, let me yes. you, forgive me for interrupting you. No. Uh, there's about 117 billion people who've lived on Earth until about 15 minutes ago. All 117 billion people seem to exactly know what was the definition of male and female. Human species comes in two phenotypes, male and female, and all of our ancestors could navigate through that minefield very easily. But 15 minutes ago, we found out that that's all wrong. Completely wrong. Wrong. So, how did we come about this? Like I joked earlier that Vinny's trying to get pregnant. It's not working, Coward. Vinny. I don't know what's Clearly happening. Clearly not. It's never going to happen. Um, but you're trying, and I respect yeah. that. 15 minutes ago, this 115 billion person sample size has come to the forefront of reality. Where we're like, well, you know, maybe men can get pregnant. There's an emoji on your iPhone. Check it right now. Oh, the a, guy. Yeah, yeah. I asked the girl that I'm, you know, hanging out with. I said. Is this just a fat guy? She goes, no, that's a pregnant guy. I go, you don't see anything wrong with this? She goes, no, of course. I'm like, no, nah, I can't deal with this. How the hell did this reality become to happen? I'm going to give you the answer. And, and forgive, I, I, I ask for forgiveness for anybody who's heard the story before. I've said it many times, but it's worth repeating. Yeah. 2002, one of my doctoral students had just defended his PhD. We're going out to dinner to celebrate. Myself, my wife, we didn't have children yet. The doctoral student and he's bringing a date. Okay. okay. By the way, hot wife. I met her. Yeah. Obviously. He did, I mean, he did very I mean, well. Yeah, yeah. Yes. go ahead. Young and hot. Young and hot, very true, thank you. Uh, so, she, uh, so he calls me about an hour or two before we go out to dinner to give me kind of a heads up. He goes, oh, I just wanted to tell you that uh, the, the lady that I'm bringing along, she's a graduate student in postmodernism, women's studies, and cultural anthropology. Oh. To, which oh. I answered, <laughs> to which I answered, yeah. ah, the holy trinity of bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> I, so I, so then I, I said to him, oh, okay, but no, no worries. Mom's the word, this is your yeah. night. I'm gonna be on my best behavior. Yeah. This is your buddy. This is my doctoral student. Okay, a student. Okay. A student who just bring his PhD. Gotcha. PhD. So we're going out to celebrate. So, of course, I was lying about the fact that it was going to go smoothly because I'm not going to forego the opportunity to grill this lady. Oh, my God. But, but I do it very politely. So, yeah. at one point, I turned to her. because This is going to answer the question, how did we get here? So, I turned to her. I say, oh, I hear you're a graduate student in postmodernism. Yes? She goes, yes. I said, there are no universal truths because postmodernism purports yeah. there are no... Other than the one objective truth that there are no objective truths, there are no objective truths. That's no. just how it works? Exactly. Yeah, that's what postmodernism purports. We're, we're shackled by subjectivity and our personal biases. Everything is relative. There is no capital Camera. T truth. Mm -hmm. I said, well, I'm an evolutionary psychologist, so I do think that there are some certain human universals. Do you mind if I propose some and then you could tell me how I'm wrong? Yeah. She, she said, go for it. So now I'm going to answer your question. I said, is it not true that for Homo sapiens, the statement, only women can bear children, is true. Is that not a universal? So she looks at me, mesmerized by my stupidity and imbecility. She scoffs at how, what a moron, you're a professor? Yeah. And she goes, no, it's not true. I said, it's not true, how is that? So then she says, there is a Japanese tribe of some Japanese island where within their folkloric mythological realm, it is the men who bear children. So by you restricting to the biological realm, that's how you keep us barefoot and pregnant. So after I recovered from the mini stroke I had at <laughs> to this, 
I said, okay, let me let me let me propose maybe, maybe a less contentious one. Yeah. Does the sun not rise in the east and set in the west? Yeah. So there she used deconstructionism. She goes, what do you mean east? What do you mean west? What do you mean the sun? That which you call the sun, I might call dancing hyena. I said, well, fine, the dancing hyena rises in the yeah, east yeah. and the west. She goes, I don't play those label games. So to answer your question, deconstructionism and postmodernism is a parasitic brain worm mm. that rewires your brain to no longer have a place where we have shared meaning. We can't agree what is male or female. It's subjective. We can't agree that only women can bear children. We don't agree what East and West is or what the sun is. You know, we're in the solar system. We can't agree what that is. That's how you get to where we are today. What is their objective? Meaning, when you're coming out and taking a stance, of course men can have babies. Of course we don't know what direction the sun is in. Of course this Japanese folklore, mystical man bearing children is reality. Of course, what's their objective? It's uh, each of these parasitic ideas, I say in the book, frees us from the pesky shackles of reality. Mm -hmm. Right, Sam? Is it okay? No, no, we're good. It, it, imagine if my genitalia did not serve as a deterministic boundary of what I can be. Okay. That, that's freeing, right? Yeah. Men could be women, left can be right, up could be down, right? Here's another example of this freeing mechanism. Social constructivism argues that there are no innate things that you're born with. Everything, you're born tabula rasa, empty mind. We're all born with equal potentiality. Now, Michael Jordan or Lionel Messi become who they become, not because they had an innate ability that made them more likely to succeed in their sports than Adam. It's because maybe mommy hugged me enough or didn't hug me enough. Well, that's a very freeing and hopeful message mm -hmm. because that means when we have children, each of us can have the next Einstein. Mm -hmm. Each of us can have the next Michael Jordan. Yeah. So it's hopeful, but perfectly bullshit. What's the future of these women, right? I don't see too many men running around saying this. There are some. I'm sure you see them on yeah. campus. They're in California, for okay, sure. Okay, they're in California or California. Portland. But, you know, we were talking with Charlie how if you look at uh, high school kids in America, the young boys are becoming more conservative and the young girls are becoming more liberal. So there's this sort of... Uh, divergence. Divergency, this K-shaped uh, generational yeah. economy going on over there. What's the future of these women that think this way? Are they feminists? Meaning they're never going to settle down and have kids and have babies. And then Charlie said, great, then we'll weed them out kind of a thing. What's the future of this mindset? Well, so in the, in the happiness book that was released in July, I talk about the longitudinal results of happiness in the United States. For men, it hasn't gone down much. In, in some cases, it's even gone up. For women, it has taken a precipitous drop over the past 30, 40 years. And I argue that that's because of the parasitic idea of radical feminism, right? Yeah. Because some ideologies are anti-human nature, right? So for example, the reason why communism always fails is because as E. O. Wilson is a famous Harvard biologist. He recently passed away. When he was asked about communism, he studies social ants. Social ants have an egalitarian society. All the social ants are equal, except of the reproductive queen, right? So when he was asked about communism, he said, great idea, wrong species, <laughs> right? Meaning that if you try to impose ideologies that are contrary to human nature, they will fail. So if you teach women that, you know, there is no value or meaning in being a mother, burn your bras, go into the bar, have endless, meaningless one night stands. It's not surprising that 30, 40 years down the line, women are gonna wake up and say, this doesn't fulfill me, yeah. right? So in the quest to create an indistinguishable reality between men and women, you ended up creating a lot of misery for women. Mm -hmm. how, how are these women gonna learn? Like the show that I do on Valuetainment, it's usually me, a couple guys, and eight to 10 women. And we're just having conversations, banter, we're doing our thing. And I really want to understand the general mindset of women because they believe that they're doing what's right for them. Listen, make some money, get your bag, get a degree, go to college, have a job, have a career. All great on the surface, but they're forgetting the indisputable truth of reality that, that women's sole priority or chief priority is to be the one gender that can actually bear children. And now you're seeing like the stat that... Uh, this is a Morgan Stanley study, 45% of women by, the, uh, by 2030 
working women ages 25 to 45 will be single, unmarried, no kids. And my joke to that is, and unhappy. Right, exactly. So what's going to happen to these women that just don't learn? So I, I tell you something. Uh, there are two things that go against women. Uh, so number one, if they're very tall. If a woman is tall, so there's something called in evolution psychology, assortative mating, right? You want to mate with someone on whom, with whom you assort on certain important traits. So men and women assort on height. It's not so much that you have to be tall. Luckily, otherwise I would have been celibate twiddling my thumbs. <laughs> Right? Because I can make up for that lack of height, right? But I need to be with someone who is shorter than me, right? So if you're a six foot two woman, the pool of available men greatly shrinks because most women abhor, it's not that they want to be with a guy who's over six two, it's that they just have to be with a guy who's taller than them, yeah. right? As a matter of fact, there was a study done with 720 naturally occurring couples. Guess how many the woman was taller than the man out of 720 couples? Five. One. 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 So if you are a tall woman and you have a PhD, start looking into adopting a lot of cats. <laughs> where, where does the concept of hypergamy come into all this, right? Hypergamy is the, the act of dating or marrying up. So one of the things I cover is, all right, women do not want to date down financially or date down on height. Men will gladly date yeah. a shorter poorer, more gorgeous women. Right. Not even a question. Hypergamy, I, yes, I assume course, you're very familiar with this. That's evolutionary psychology on the basis. How does that work in all this? Well, here's the interesting thing. The, the, the more high powered the woman is, the more she insists on the guy being of higher status. Of course. This is actually opposes the argument that the only reason that women look for high status guys is because historically they were left out of the status game. And that's not true. Oprah and the diplomat and the female neurosurgeon are even more in desperate need to have a guy that is higher status. Now, the reason is very simple. Uh, women look for guys that can procure resources and protect those resources, right? And therefore, if you do, David, do you know who David Buss is? Yeah, of course, Dr. David Buss, David, yeah, right. evolutionary psychologist. Psychology. Yeah, exactly. of course. One of the pioneers on mate choice behavior. He's done studies across cultures, and there are two universals that you consistently find. Men are much more likely to place a premium on youth and beauty, irrespective of culture. Yeah. And women are much more likely to place a premium on uh, attributes that correlate to uh, status. So it doesn't have to be the number of zeros in your bank account. It could be, for example, if you're funny, you're a comedian. Because being funny is a proxy measure of intelligence, right? Very few people are funny who are also dull and, and you know, idiots, right? Yeah. And therefore, when a woman says, I'm attracted to a guy who's funny, she's effectively saying, I'm attracted to a guy who is intelligent, right? Dave Chappelle is more intelligent than a lot of the professor colleagues that I have. He doesn't have the fancy degrees, right? But his ability to be able to put together these incredible uh, stand-up comedy routines speaks to his intelligence. So uh, status is a fundamental rubric of evolutionary theory. What, the only thing that changes across culture is how you define status. In one culture, it might be the number of cattle head I own. In another culture, it might be whether I have an Ivy League degree. Yeah. But what is clear, there is no woman who's ever said this. Give me a pear-shaped guy with a nasal voice who plays video games all day and who's unemployed. Let's have sex. <laughs> <laughs> Never. Pity, I don't know how yeah, you know. Yeah, no. So, uh, so uh, yeah, what... What, what was the name of the book? Your, the, the recent one? The, the Sad Truth About Happiness. The Sad Truth About Happiness. So if, if you had to just, in a nutshell, because I think we have a couple minutes left. So yeah, just somebody that, just not a list or just, how would you, how would you define what, what for, for somebody to be happy, what's, what's the key? What, what well, would you give? give quick yeah, please okay. do. So number one, choosing the right spouse is fundamental key to happiness. Choosing the right profession is fundamental. So one of the reasons why, I mean, I'm dispositionally happy. About 50% of our happiness comes from our genes, but that still leaves about 50% up for grabs, right? Yeah. So the types of decisions you make, the types of mindsets that you adopt can, can move you either one way or the other on habits. So choose the right spouse, choose the right uh, job, uh, live life as though it's a playground. So one of the things that I do, as you guys know, is I play around, I have Good. fun. Good. I, I wear the the, the I've the seen your blue wig. wig you and see the, me self-flagellate. Yeah. You see me hiding under the table. Funniest professor in the world. I love it. 
Why don't you just say funniest person? Don't add <laughs> Don't why? Yeah, why have to put another? Well, you got to be exactly. competing with Chappelle's and the no, best. No, no, just That's just go. I, I, now we're getting into DEI stuff. Okay, get, fine, okay fine. go ahead, go. Uh, but but so live life as a playground. Uh, live life with anticipatory regret. So, for example, Jeff, Jeffrey Bezos, when he decided should he stay in his high-paying executive job or start Amazon, he said, I didn't want later in life to look back with regret at having not done it, right? Yeah. There are two types of regrets in life, regret due to action and regret due to inaction. I, so regret due to action is, I regret that I cheated on my wife and now my marriage is over. Yeah. Regret due to inaction is, I always wanted to be an artist but I became a pediatrician because my dad is a pediatrician. Yeah. It turns out that over the long run, the most looming regrets that people have are of inaction. Inaction, inaction. So therefore I tell people, live an authentic life. One of the reasons I think, if I could speak of myself, why I resonate in, in, the, in a big, is because I'm authentic. Whatever you see is what I am. I'm authentic in a one-on-one, -on -one, and I'm authentic existentially. I pursue my passions. I never use a playbook. I have fun. I'm irreverent. Uh, Anti-fragility is another important one. Anti-fragility is the idea that you want to build in something into the system that is not brittle, right? Yeah. So if you look at Lionel Messi, J.K. Rowling, Steven Spielberg, Michael Jordan, they all had tons of rejections. Imagine if they had stopped and said, ah, oh, forget. Michael Jordan was uh, cut from his sophomore high school team. Yeah. Right. Lionel Messi, Messi was told he's too small to be a professional soccer player. J.K. Rowling was rejected by every publisher until the last one who didn't reject her. Uh, Steven Spielberg was rejected not once, not twice, but three times from USC's film school. So imagine if each of those guys would have said, pack it in. So I kind of go through all of these life lessons and hopefully people yeah, find the, it interesting. The la last point. So anti-fragility. I talk about how a man needs to be resilient. Yes. That's kind of, you know, you're going to run through obstacles in your life. You know, the, the old phrase, get knocked down 10 times, get up 11. We, we all understand this. Um, and I think that's important for men to understand. And I'm glad that we touched on the happiness. So the, 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 the name of your newest book. The Sad Truth About Happiness, Eight Secrets for Leading the Good Life. Okay, the happiness. And I'm glad that, that Vinny touched on this. And I, you said that the, um, the, it's almost like the fear-greed index, if you're familiar with how that works, that be fearful when people are greedy, be greedy when people are fearful. It's an economic thing. Right. Uh, Warren Buffett has said it. You talk about, so on my show, the Sawscast on Valuetainment, it's where finance meets romance, right? Yes. And right. I think that's super important. Sure. And you talk about the, the key ingredients for happiness are what? Choosing the right profession and choosing the right mate. Yes. I heard the uh, podcaster, Chris Williamson, you familiar with Chris? Yeah, I was on his show recently. Okay, he's a great dude. He talked about you choose your regrets. Yeah. We all choose our regrets, meaning I made the choice to cheat on my wife or I didn't make the choice right. to go down this career. Everyone's so concerned with happiness, right? I just want to be happy, I just want to be happy. I don't have a definition, but for me, happiness is where you, um, you have meaning and, your, and purpose to your life, and you go do something, you put that into action and do something about it. And then your competence will learn into confidence, and all of a sudden, the more confident and your shoulders are back, the happier you are. Explain the happiness effect overall, because everyone wants to be happy, they just want to be happy, but what does that really mean? But they, so I, I have a quote from Viktor Frankl. You know, you know who that is, Viktor Frankl? Uh, I know the name, he, yes. He's, he was a Holocaust survivor, and he wrote a book on the meaning of life, where he basically says, you don't pursue success, it's something that comes. So I just changed his quote by simply replacing success by happiness. So I don't wake up in the morning and say, here are the steps for how I should be happy. But rather, if I've made the right choices, if I've adopted the right mindsets, then happiness will be an outcome of that, right? right. And so I wake up every day, the person next to me is someone other than being beautiful and so on, is someone that I really love and respect. So I'm already off to a good start. Imagine yeah. if I wake up next to this person, oh, geez, God damn. I've been there yet. Yeah. There okay. you go. So I wake up next to a person I admire and respect and love. Now I go off into the world to hopefully offer things to the world that brings people joy and happiness and knowledge and wisdom and laughter. Well, that gives me purpose and meaning. And then I return home at night to that person that I respect that I left that morning. Well, I've cracked the secret code to happiness, right? Yeah. And so, so it's really not this magic recipe. It's that, you know, for example, some people will end up marrying someone because they're sexually attracted to them. Guess what? That's going to wane. 
right? Now, that yeah. doesn't mean that you still can't have sexual attraction to your partner of 20 years, but you can't use that as the metric because it's going to naturally wane. Helen Fisher, do you know who that is? No, I don't know. Helen Fisher is a biological anthropologist. She's written a, a books on sort of the neuroanatomy of love. So the, the butterflies that you get and that feeling, that lust, doesn't, can't sustain you yeah. 20 years into your marriage. So there has to be something else. So shared beliefs. So for example, if, if you meet someone at this uh, turning point and you're a wokester, I can almost bet that it's not going to last even though you had a great night together and you were very sex, sex, sexually attracted to each other because you don't share the fundamental belief system. So that's, by the way, called birds of a feather flock together yeah. in assorted of mating in evolution psychology. So my wife and I, perhaps because we're Lebanese, but also because we view the world in the same way, we've already, statistically speaking, have a much higher chance of being successful because we view life through the same lens. So try to find someone with whom you share beliefs and hopefully it will work out. All right, well, That's now right. we have and, a mission. And, and, and I love it because we've heard this too. Pat said this, because I'm just like you, Gad. Um, Pat said there's a difference between being childlike and be, being childish. Yeah. We give off that, like you said, go out, life is a playground. We have fun, I want other people to have fun. And it literally exudes off of you and like, I never met you, but the moment I saw you, I felt as if I knew you for a while. Oh, that's so lovely. you practice what you preach. Thank you. God bless you. Nice meeting you. I hope the book. And can you say the book one more time, Gat, so everybody the knows? The Sad Truth About Happiness, yeah. Eight Secrets for Leading a Good Life. Well, you make me happy. Oh, the the, the, Gad, the you, fact bro. that your last name is Sad. Yeah, By the way, in, in, in Arabic, and you write about in happiness. Arabic, yeah. it means felicity and happiness. So I was destined to write this book. He was destined. Well, there yeah, it is. Uh, Happy to see you. you Great to see you. You're uh, you're authentic. You. You're smart. You're real. And I understand why the people love you. Look forward Thank to more so stuff. Uh, go get the newest book, The Sad Truth, Truth About, about Happiness. happiness. Gad Sad, it's on ladies Amazon? and gentlemen. It's on Amazon. It's yeah. on Amazon. Get his book or else. Gad Sad, ladies and gentlemen. Whoa, whoa, whoa. If you like that one, click right here to watch the full Sauce cast, And don't forget to subscribe to the channel.